Hello, John Monroe here um, with the second in my conversations uh, in my stealing cars project. Um, this time I had the great good fortune uh, to speak with Rituparna Das, who is a PhD student uh, in the Ranbir and Chitra Gupta uh, School of Infrastructure and uh, Design and Management at the in Indian Institute of Technology in Karanjpur. Uh, in India. And I came across her work. She's a co-author uh, with Anki Banerjee of an article entitled Identifying the Parameters for Assessment of Child Friendliness in Urban Neighborhoods in Indian Cities. Uh, and this appeared in the Journal of Urban Affairs. And it was very useful for me reading it. It's very interesting. I'll post a link uh, below this video for others who might want to have a look and I recommend that you do. Um, and um, so, so what Ritu Parna uh, and her colleagues are working on is the, the idea uh, of centering age as a category um, of analysis, thinking about um, cities, thinking about infrastructure, thinking about urban planning um, in terms of uh, how this affects children, but also more significantly thinking about it from the perspective of children. and. Um, Ritu Parna and her colleagues ran a pilot project in which they, they uh, interview and speak with children to get their perspectives on urban space, on um, green space, on playgrounds, how to get to them, and so on. So I had a really interesting conversation with her um, about this work, and again, uh, thinking about it in terms of how it might inform my own, because these stealing cars conversations that I'm doing are exactly designed um, for me to try to learn something um, about this idea of theft of public space in different contexts in terms of what uh, the domination of private automobility uh, does. So, hope you enjoy the conversation. I'll say one thing, the volume was, we had a little bit of problems with the volume uh, in the earlier part of the interview. If you're listening to this, um, I would say persevere because that uh, sort of is corrected uh, in time and uh, don't let that put you off getting um, uh, learning from the, the many insights, it's a very rich series of, of comments that uh, Rita Parna uh, Das has to share in this conversation I had with her. So, hope you enjoy. Okay, well, hi everyone. My name is John Monroe, and I teach U.S. history at the University of Birmingham. I'm speaking today with Ritu Parna Das about the intersection between car culture and other structures of power as part of the research, uh, part of a new research project I'm, I'm working on entitled Stealing Cars. Ritu Parna is currently pursuing doctoral research uh, in the Chitra Gupta School of Infrastructure Design and Management at the Indian Institute of Technology in Karajpur. She graduated with a degree in architecture from Odisha, Kadak, India, and now, post-graduation, she's in city planning with the Department of Architecture and Regional Planning at the Indian Institute of Technology, Karajpur. Her doctoral work assesses the lives of children at the neighborhood level and looks at improving them, how to improve them, uh, by using an urban design framework. So hello, Rita Parna. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me Thank today. Thank you so much. Um, so can you say a little bit about yourself to start us off? How did you become interested in urban transportation and city planning as academic subjects? Okay, to begin with, I'll say uh, from my childhood, I had a good opportunity to stay in different places since uh, both my parents had the transferable job. So I was also traveling places along with them. So naturally, when I got into architecture, I started learning more about people and the places. And gradually I started developing that inclination to know more about the place and how it connects with the people. And when we are talking about people and the place, naturally people are always moving from one place to the other, be it work, be it recreation. So naturally I started thinking more and about transportation and how they actually perceive a space. And yeah, that's how I got into it. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, it's an interesting topic to think about in a scholarly way, because in some ways it's something that everyone thinks about and has a reason to think about in different ways, but to actually take it to, especially PhD research is a, is a different whole question. And for me, my research has not been about these questions and it's just starting to be more coming out of something that I'm thinking about anyway. So it's very interesting to hear your uh, sort of trajectory here. So I know very little, next to nothing, about uh, transport issues in, in India, but I'm very interested. Um, it's great to be talking to you to learn more about them. So as someone who 
works at an institution in Karajpur, which is a smaller city, but also I understand a, a regional rail hub. Um, but you also spend time in Kolkata, uh, which is of course a world mega city. Can you give us something of an overview? This is a big question, but something of an overview of the main transportation uh, challenges in these two centers? Um, in Kolkata, I'll say, if you're talking about the transportation aspect, it has a long history of its own because uh, it started uh, if we see, talk about the history of Calcutta, it is almost 200 to 400 years old city. So it, usually what we say the foundation day of Kolkata, it was around 1600s when the East India Company came. So after that, actually the transportation system had gone a rapid change. Initially, people were dependent uh, on various modes of transport. We had ferries, we had handheld rickshaws, we had trams, we had railways also. But gradually we see more private sector buses and uh, four wheelers coming up so naturally we see a, a very a good amount of change in the transportation pattern which we have which has evolved from we have both greener modes of transport coming up we have both electrical mode for that we have other non-motorized modes as well as right now we are seeing a transformation from the petrol and the diesel dependent uh, transportation modes as well and talking about Kharagpur, I'll say it is almost 100 kilometers from the city of Calcutta. So the major uh, connectivity, I'll say, is by road and railways, yes. And Kharagpur as a city, it's near uh, one city, and it is relatively very small. But uh, I'll say it has uh, people here are very much dependent on the private vehicles. Um, and public vehicles, I'll say, relatively, it is less than Kolkata because Kolkata, the networking pattern is really good because we have the uh, last mile connectivities and the other can, uh, street network is such that it is very easy to reach the places in Calcutta. Whereas in Kharagpur, it is slightly dispersed. And being an institutional hub as well as a railway hub, it has its own charm and yes. Yeah, I see. Oh, that's interesting to think that it seems like there's an issue of sprawl in the smaller center. Yes. I mean, I'm sure Kolkata has issues of sprawl also is just such a large yeah. city. Actually, Kolkata, I'll say it developed in, uh, in a very uh, phase-wise manner. Initially, it was a very concentrated, uh, in a very concentrated form, but gradually it started moving towards the eastern side. We have planned townships which came up in 1980s, the Salt Lake area. And after that, the new town, the Rajarat area also came up. So naturally, we have uh, seen a little bit of sprawl. So just to reduce the congestion within the city boundaries. So yeah, transportation yeah. system initially was a problem, slightly difficult in the suburban areas, but I think we are coping up with that, uh, that part of the transportation issues as well in Calcutta. Right, wow. So a lot of sort of things in, uh, in motion, as it were, there's a lot of dynamics happening. So that's, that's very interesting to, to hear. So, I mean, I guess one of the reasons why I particularly wanted to speak to you was because I really enjoyed um, the Journal of Urban Affairs article you co-authored with Anki Banerjee entitled Identifying the Parameters for Assessment of Child Friendliness in Urban Neighborhoods in Indian Cities. So as home to the largest child population in the world, India is, I mean, simply just by that statistic, the most important country in which to take up the issues that your paper looks at. But I also think that your research holds important lessons for other parts of the world as well. So in this article, you and Professor Banerjee rightly note that, and I'm quoting you here, children can be good benchmarks of what constitutes a livable, healthy city. Yet you also point out that urban planning in India, and again, this doesn't apply to India alone, rarely considers the perspectives of children in determining how cities are organized. So my question for you is, in what ways is age a useful category of analysis when thinking about the organization of public space? Actually, uh, first I would like to begin with when we have uh, planning, the, when we were started planning the Indian cities, it was based under the five-year plans initially. India actually started the five-year plan concept just to uh, have a proper idea, proper vision to actually develop the cities in a way that the economic part is also not neglected. So it was a very interdependent aspect when the urbanization process and the economic role which played into it. So after that, what happened is uh, the plans which came up, the planning for the, when I'm talking about the URDPFI guidelines, those are the uh, in guidelines which have been formulated by the government of India. Uh, when it comes to, uh, these are the standards I'll say, 
such as the minimum uh, limitation of uh, area benchmarking, what is the amount of area which is required when we are designing parks at a neighborhood level or at a city level or at a regional level. So when we are talking about these benchmarking, there were actually no such benchmark when we are talking about the children. When the children were often excluded from the planning process, it was always a uh, top-down approach, we, I'll say, because uh, usually the decision makers and the planners, they were more oriented towards thinking of about the working class people. So naturally, the age factor, I would say the children were often neglected when we were planning for children. And that's why what we will see in the later part, when the city was having an organic settlement, it was more walkable for children. It was more uh, friendly for children. But as the city grew and it, the city started developing new patterns and forms in the grid iron form, it, was, it became more difficult for children to commute from one place to the other. They were becoming more dependent on their parents. So that's what, when I did my study in Kharagpur, it was a pilot survey. What I saw is that children were mainly accompanied by their parents. But when I interviewed the parents, the parents had a very different opinion. They often walked or cycled to the schools and the nearby locations. But here, the children were often under the caretakers or under the parents, or they were actually very much dependent on somebody else for the movement from one location to the other. So that's why I think that age definitely played a very different, very important role, I'll say, when it comes to planning. Like, they are often neglected, I'll say, when it comes to planning. Yeah, and that comes through very strongly in, in the research. I'll say a couple other things that I really liked about the, about the article. One is, you know, you talk about green space, which is, of course, green space and parks, which is obviously really important for, for children. And you also, you know, you make the point, the World Health Organization um, sort of um, advises that children get more exercise, of course. The children themselves want to get more exercise. They want to get out in the parks and play. Um, and so you talk about green space and parks as facilitating that, but you also take up the other related, hugely important question, how do you get to the park is of course, another kinds of kind of question. And obviously when a city, um, and I know this here in Birmingham too as well, that, that you know, a city can have lovely green spaces, but when it's dangerous to get to them, then especially for children where you wouldn't want them to travel alone, as you note in the research, parents are, are very concerned about the danger of traffic. Um, that that's, that that's another kind of issue. So I thought that was really uh, just such an important insight is to point out how, you know, as you say, that the perspectives of children are not really, um, are kind of an, an afterthought or they're not really, you know, they're not, they're not at the center. They're barely even at the margins of what, of what many planners are thinking about. And that's just in terms of even making, you know, provision for parks, let alone how you get to them. So that was, that was very interesting. But one other thing I just wanted to highlight you spoke to the children themselves. This was su such an important uh, aspect. Could you say a little bit about that in the pilot study about, about speaking to the children, getting their perspectives? What was that like? Can you tell us a little bit about that part of the research? Um, actually, the survey which I did, uh, I, had, uh, I had given them the questionnaire. It was thought I wanted to do a participatory planning approach where I asked about the play spaces and the common recreational areas. They were the feedback which I received was quite interesting. Like uh, they, uh, by some part of the, uh, like, when few kids, they were more interested in parks and playgrounds. Some children, maybe because of the lack of exposure to parks and playgrounds, or maybe due to the parental restrictions, they enjoyed maybe indoor activities more. So naturally, I would say the parental perspective also plays a very important role when we are actually allowing our children to go outside. As you have mentioned, that often the in India parents play a very important role in the decision-making process of the children. Even here, I think uh, most of the children in Calcutta, there are studies where they have mentioned children are very much dependent on the carpooling concept, where number of children, they are escorted by a private, um, privately owned vehicles, or they are more dependent on the school bus. So yes, like children here, since uh, it's a small town, they have great access to parks and playgrounds. But in Calcutta, I'll say they have very limited access. And one more interesting thing to note is that a uh, very sad reality, I'll say, that the amount of green space in Calcutta is reducing, especially in the core areas. So naturally, children are confined within the indoor in their houses. And uh, secondly, I'll say the road space is also it's a little bit um, congested. Because of that, as you said, children 
the mode of access also gets very much restricted. So yes, that is the basic difference what I find because Tarapur being very less populated, the scope of going and traveling alone is relatively higher, but in Calcutta, we see a little bit more restricted opportunities for children. Like I think that is it. I hope I come up with a more detailed review of my final analysis. Uh, I, I caught just about everything you said, but just at the end, your your volume was cutting out a little. I just missed the last little uh, part about what you were saying. Uh, the volume is gone. I can't hear you. I'm not sure what the issue is. Uh, just a sec. Oh, it's back. It's back. Okay, okay. So uh, what I was telling is uh, children in Calcutta or Kolkata, uh, the central areas, basically the CBD area of Kolkata, where it is more mostly urbanized, people, the children especially, they don't have access. And in fact, very uh, uh, interesting thing to note is that the schools in Calcutta also, they don't have playgrounds. Like if um, as in the report uh, by the government, it has been seen that uh, the study which they have done that only 33% of the schools in Calcutta, they have green spaces. So naturally I feel the children are missing out their lives like within their by staying indoors because as a child i'll say from my experience i had the opportunity to see uh, access to green spaces around my home but when i see children in calcutta children are either confined within the home study or they are being escort, uh, escorted to their uh, tuition facilities or coaching centers yes so that is the thing i feel so Green spaces is declining, and secondly, people are having reduced access to them, children especially. Yeah, exactly. And it's just such an important point, I think, generally for, for planners or for those of us who are interested in how cities work. If you want an insightful perspective on the operation of a city, ask children. You know, they often have the, the greatest insights into these um, in terms of the, you know, the quality of the green space as well as the amount of it and so on. But this is also a really uh, crucial issue is immediate access to green space or, or playgrounds for children at their schools. If they don't, if there isn't something adjacent to the school, then that's gonna, re cause that's obviously, you know, one important institution where that can be facilitated, right? Of course, there's the breaks and lunchtime and so on, the children are playing outside. And if there isn't adequate, just sort of space for that, then that's gonna be another uh, area of, of difficulty. I mean, I imagine that the the teachers, first of all, and maybe the, the people who are planning the schools are probably, they must be thinking about this as well, because of course, they're going to be the first to yes. notice that this is a big issue, right? Uh, actually, I'll say uh, it's something, we have both government and private schools. The problem is that uh, the land value also is very important here, like getting a land for developing new schools with playgrounds, it's very difficult. The old schools, in Calcutta, which uh, is almost uh, almost 50, 60 years old, they still have green spaces, but something which is, has come up very newly for them, it, uh, it is very difficult to find green spaces within those schools. Yeah. So uh, even after school hours, I'd say parents are very much reluctant to send their children because the type of education we have in India also plays a very important role. It's slightly competitive here, I'd say. So yes, the parents also, they find it's... Uh, more important to study more than uh, giving them children, like allowing the children to play in parks and playgrounds. That is also a very important part, I feel. Yes, of course, of course, this idea you're at school to learn, not necessarily to just play. Um, but of course, as your work suggests, um, even if it's not the focus of your work, but clearly children who have access to places to exercise and play, it's only going to enhance, obviously, yes. uh, their interest in and even their performance, probably academically. So. Um, this is also uh, just an important aspect of, of the work that you're doing. So let me ask you another question. In reading your article, I was reminded that the UN Convention uh, on the Rights of the Child was signed in 1989. And for me, this date always stands out as a historian of the Cold War. So I was thinking about the timing of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the fact that it was signed less than um, two weeks after the opening of the Berlin Wall. So it arrives at this really important kind of moment in, in global history which of course signals the collapse of communism uh, as an alternative and the, and the victory of capitalism as the, as the now global form of how um, economies and dominant ideologies are, are kind of organized. So of course with capitalism comes more of a 
focus on individualism. And so I was curious if you thought that this individualism of capitalism as an ideology and a way of organizing a society, does this have an impact on how urban space is organized in India? In India, yes, it definitely played a very important role because uh, after our independence in 1947, India was still um, coming out of the aftermath, I'll say. And very interestingly, in, uh, in 1971, there was a war. And here, West Bengal actually got divided into Bangladesh and West Bengal. So that too, uh, West Bengal was dealing with the migrant crisis as well. So suddenly, there was a rapid influx of population here. So I think more than... Uh, it was a very important and difficult phase, I see, when um, the city, especially Kolkata, was dealing with a very huge number of populations. And actually, uh, it was a very uh, uh, difficult phase, I see, because the city was trying to orient itself with the growing population suddenly. And uh, the transportation system was also in, in a very difficult uh, state. And uh, I'll say... Uh, that is, uh, I think after that in 1991, what happened? We had this uh, liberalization problem. Uh, we had this uh, liberalization, privatization, and globalization phenomenon. It was then when, when suddenly we uh, saw the private sector economy gaining more importance. And uh, it was in 1991 that uh, there, were the, there were these reforms which actually helped in improving the economy, but at the same time, it impacted the urban spaces as well. Since the real estate market became very much important, the importance was slightly neglected on the planning process. Like there were, as I said, there were generic uh, planning regulations which came up, but it definitely did not include the people. Uh, definitely in the sense like the, con the, gen the general concerns of the people were often neglected. Then, as I said, the amount of green spaces, it was mandated, but usually it was often overlooked. The building by uh, the master plans which came up, that too also it uh, underwent slight modification depending upon the requirement of the land. So yes, uh, so I will say capital capitalism did play an important role because we see the num amount of road space also, it started declining. As the city grew in Calcutta, I'll say, uh, usually in cities like Bombay and Mumbai and Delhi, the road space is something around 20%, 15 to 20%, but in Calcutta, if you see the road space is, road space was 6%, which has recently come down to 4%, which is really, really less. So people here in Calcutta and Kolkata, they are now striving to, actually they're uh, striving to improve the road conflict which we are facing. So yes, the, there are lot, there has been sudden increase of cars which we are having here in our city. Because um, between 2013 and 20, the, and the, um, the number of two-wheeler two motorized vehicles has increased as well. It has increased by almost nine times. And the four-wheeler personal vehicles, that too has increased almost eight times, which is quite high. So yes, capitalism, I'll say, it did play a very important role. People may start, and people here are gradually realizing that. I feel so people here have now started promoting for walkability and using bicycle modes and uh, sad part I'll say is and there are streets in Kolkata where bicycling is not actually uh, a legal thing to do so there are restrictions on bicyclists as well they are not allowed uh, supposed to use flyovers so I'll say that is slightly a very uh, sad part yes like and like not allowing a person to cycle on the roads like they have a they have to take a very different route so yes, that is very crucial. Yeah, wow. So many things in what you just said. Um, I mean, the, the layering of this more recent, um, you know, sort of global dominance of capitalism, but as you point out, layered over, of course, the colonial and post-colonial history. And I think it's also interesting in the Indian example, you know, um, I think globally about India's sort of place in the, in the global Cold War, as a non-aligned country that had relations with the Soviet Union and with the United States, of course. Um, but as you remind us, of course, India is such a vast and diverse country itself. The regional particularities are hugely important. And of course, the independence of Bangladesh and, the, and that brutal war in 1971 um, is, is, of course, going to have a very immediate and, yes. and huge impact on the specific um, yes. situation in, in that um, part of the country. So um, 
So that's interesting. And then also the, um, yeah, exactly. The way that the, that the, the private sector is more dominant um, yes. than was the case before. And it connects right back to what you were talking earlier about land um, value and the, you know, if, if land is, is seen more purely as a commodity, um, then therefore things like the value of the land as rated on the market is usually going to win out against concerns of something like um, exercise for children or, you know, um, you know, emotional uh, well-being and so on of children is, 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 is likely going to come secondary. But another thing you said, and I want to ask you a little bit more about this, this is, uh, I'm very curious about this. So why is the amount of, can you say a little bit more about why you think the amount of road space in Calcutta is less than in Mumbai and other uh, Indian cities? Why is that? 6%, that's that's like considerably less. What's going yes. on there? I think uh, the core city center, uh, it, when it was, uh, it was, since it was, it had a very organic sort of settlement pattern, the streets were relatively narrow. Like if we see the culture in Calcutta and the planning system in Calcutta, we see not Calcutta, it is very dense. The type of residential set settlement we have there is like uh, around 100, 150 years old, or, like like that. But uh, the settlement pattern was more organized in the southern pa part of Calcutta. So maybe that way I'll say the main city area, the six person road space was conserved. But although uh, in the southern part of Calcutta, the road space was provided, but due to this encroachment practices, um, this uh, thing started to be neg and maybe it was uh, uh, neglected in the long run due to which the road space it, it is there is a huge difference but right now i'll say the newly developed places the peripheral areas the new townships which are coming up around calcutta such as uh, salt lake which is right in the northeast part of calcutta and newtown area those are pretty well planned because they have a very different right of way they have a very organized sort of transportation pattern so yeah, the original Calcutta, the old Calcutta, I'd say the road space is a huge problem because that time people, the uh, the perception of having cars was also less. The main mode of transport being cycling and walking, people, they were not very much dependent for them. Uh, the dependency on the cars was not that much, but gradually when due to this urbanization pattern and this densification pattern, this migration, everything, the settlement pattern became a little bit of a uh, disoriented, I'd say not disoriented, I'll say it wasn't much organized the way we expect it to be. So that way the planning became slightly more oriented towards the land and the road space was neglected in the long run. So yeah. that is completely what I think, yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and it also says something about the intersection maybe between, you know, we're talking about age here as a category, but also where age and class intersect yes. because of course, who can afford a car is a question of, of means and of, of class position. So it's also, I, I feel like, you know, your work brings so much in terms of bringing, I think people, I think to say class matters when we're thinking about urban space, yes, most people definitely. already would kind of have a sense of that, right? Um, a car can cost quite a bit of money and cost quite a bit of money to maintain and so on and so forth. So only certain people can afford that. But I don't think anybody would be shocked to think about that. Whereas, I think thinking about that and thinking about age at the same time is a, is another kind of just, I don't know, for me, a much more novel and interesting way to, to think about this. Okay, let me move on to another. There's so much to, there's so much to talk about. This is all so interesting. But as you know, one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you is because I'm conducting this um, sort of series of conversations with experts um, on cars and cities to gather some information for this paper that I'm working on entitled Stealing Cars. And in my own uh, paper, um, as I mentioned to you, I hope to consider um, the idea that cars themselves steal as a kind of mode of transportation that privatizes public space. And so in that, I want to consider um, how privatization is a racial and gendered and also colonial phenomenon. So I wanted to ask you two kind of questions related um, to this. So first, again, We've already mentioned, you know, sort of colonialism here and there in our conversation, but let's let's bring it to the center a little bit more. Um, and you know, in conversations about colonialism, of course, in in um, United Kingdom, there's a there's a, a very live uh, and multifaceted conversation about colonialism. Um, its critics, its its defenders, etc. But the the 
Transport is very central to this because people often talk about trains. Those who are apologists for imperialism, they want to deflect from all of the exploitation and all of the uh, oppressions that went with colonialism by saying something to the effect of, well, well, didn't we bring trains to places like India as though that sort of um, a useful balance sheet way of thinking about it, which I certainly do not think that it is, but it's interesting just to think about this in terms of transport but less about trains here and more thinking about, again, automobility and individualism. I'm wondering if there's anything to this idea that, that automobility and, individual, and the individualist I ideology that sustains it is a kind of transportation legacy from the long period of colonialism um, that continues uh, into, to, to structure post-colonial reality in a place like India. Is there a way that we can see automobility as particularly the way that it's connected to the individualist kind of ideologies of capitalism and also colonialism. Is there a way of connecting automobility to the longer history of colonialism? Actually, what I'd say the class system, which was there in uh, Kolkata, it was uh, either um, the middle class, upper class, uh, and it has uh, since uh, um, um, my study area, is very much uh, oriented towards the children and uh, the type of history which I have come across. I'll say uh, the car culture is much more prominent now because uh, during the colonial times, I'll say people, they were more very much dependent on the public transit which they were provided with, like the trams which we had, the trains. But gradually the car culture came around 1980s, I'll say, after our independence because uh, that time the sudden influx of population and the public transit which we were given that wasn't being sufficient to meet the needs of the sudden requirement of the people so yes the trains and everything we are slightly uh, the metro st uh, stations especially that also came up in 1980s so the car culture i'll say it only came in calcutta around 1980s and after 1990s when there was a um, there were reforms in the, the there were economic reforms because india being an agrarian economy this uh, sector was not given much importance it was um, as we as i said we were dealing with the independence period post independence period so naturally there was a lot of migration and uh, the settlement was a more important factor for them like a good and a good life i'll say because Owning a car wasn't a priority for most of the people. For them, having a roof under the head was a very big important part of their lives. So car culture was there during, I'll say, the colonial times. Yes, there, as I said, there were like the, the town itself, Calcutta, in the maps, if we see the older maps, there, we often know there were black towns and there were white towns. That's how they segregated Calcutta. So the obviously the white towns for the settlements, the white settle, settlers which we had, the, and the black town were basically the working class people who actually took care of all the necessities and the all the facilities which were the amenities the infrastructures so yes uh, in so there was a time uh, where there were plagues there was this uh, i'll say uh, there was a problem of uh, actually health uh, just uh, there uh, There was famine, yes, sorry, I just missed the word. Uh, uh, there were pro issues with famine as well, which which also played a very important role. So since uh, our state was already dealing with so many national calamities as well as these food crises, so naturally uh, the car culture slightly took a back seat during the colonial times and people had a very different so set of priorities that time. So uh, that's very interesting. And of course, that's right, you know, that that the, um, the dominance of the car is a more recent phenomenon in many, in, in Britain for that matter, you know, it's, it's more something of more recent decades, even though it has a bit of a longer history. I'll need to keep thinking about this and that's very instructive for me um, because what I'm also interested in the idea is even if there wasn't such a domination of cars, you know, I mean, before 1947, yeah. right? Of course that would be the case. Um, but the way in which colonialism creates a kind of a system of dominance, a kind of ideology, a kind of mindset yes. of dominance, of, of 
you know, the famines you mentioned in India, I mean, the, um, the famines of the, um, the late, you know, uh, Mike Davis calls them uh, late Victorian Holocaust, you know, these, these um, famines uh, in, in different colonial spaces and in India being a, a prime example. Of course, one of the reasons was because the British Empire was taking yes. the, the grains, the foodstuffs, uh, out of extracting them out of the country. So even though that story has really nothing to do with cars, cars are barely on the scene at this at the at that far back. But but what it might do is is sort of establish a kind of extractivist mentality and a kind of mode of domination that says the person who has the power can take what they want. Yes. So then we could maybe think about that as a way of how sort of car culture operates, even though the cars themselves are more new, but they arrive. Yes. in this kind of longer ideological uh, context that colonialism sets up, and then that perhaps, um, you know, global neoliberalism sort of further entrenches um, in, in different examples. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not, it would be silly to try to say, you know, that, that the car culture question is connected to colonialism because there were always lots of cars. Of course not, but that's, that's exactly it, that there's there's different actually modes. what i'll uh, point yeah, out please. is that the british planning policies and practice it was more oriented towards the improvement of their lives but when we're talking about the citizens who were the original residents of calcutta and the surrounding places it was um i'll say it was primarily for their control and surveillance like the black town i said like uh, patrick geddes he came to india he spoke about his conservative his uh conservative surgery um, where he spoke about uh, rehabilitating the black town people because um, it, the health of the people were very very poor i'll say and the condition of the place was also very shabby because it was not maintained that well so yes there were attempts to actually improve the place but i'll say the policies and the reforms they were not actually that supportive as we could have had expected so yes after that phase um, there were many reforms to improve that place we still have that old legacy which is still there but which we may not forget but we can always learn from that that what was the um, initial state and how much we how far we have come across from that phase yeah yeah very interesting um i saw recently uh amitav ghosh has uh the the novelist has a, a great piece in the guardian um on this kind of he's not talking about car culture but this longer the ways that these longer histories of of kind of colonial forms of, of domination that we're talking about. Um, he's talking about it more in terms of the, the climate crisis, which of course cars are very re related to as well. But again, thinking about this, this kind of mindset and the and the long histories that, that bring us to, to the place that we're, that we're in. Okay, another question um, about this sort of stealing cars idea. Now, uh, and I really rely, I mean, I'm relying on your expertise throughout this conversation, but again, to bring it back to age, which you've, thought about so so deeply is theft actually a useful way to think about childhood deprivation as caused by car culture i'm wondering because you know again i'm i'm starting to think about this for a paper i'm working on and i'm kind of thinking oh theft as a as a as a way of thinking about this does it work thinking about theft and age theft of childhood i'm not sure what do you think Yes, there is definitely a theft of childhood, I'll say. Now, at least what I perceive uh, is a peop in children in Calcutta, when I've done the surveys, I've interviewed with people, I've spoke with people, what I've seen, there is always some sort of lamentation which they do. Like I've seen so many people, elderly people, they often say we had a very good upbringing, the type of neighborhoods we had, the, cult uh, the people we had and the type of access we had to public places and the green spaces was quite high. I have, uh, there are people who still, they don't want to come out of that organic settlements and they want to just move into some sort of uh, gated community because they like that old city charm and they don't want to get into that uh, newly organized sort of settlement. And children too, I think somehow in the long run, due to the lack of exposure to green spaces and uh, lack of, uh, I'd say uh, not just green spaces, the public spaces as well, just because they are constantly monitored and supervised, children are lacking, missing out. They, uh, here children are becoming more uh, dependent on the, I'll say, the video games, the more electronic medias and everything. And it is very, very visible right now. And right now due to COVID time, COVID crisis, I know that 
I interviewed the parents as well then, and they said even they are like very much upset about the current situation where children they don't have access to green spaces. They are so much into this uh, electronic media, and they are missing out a huge part of their childhood. The suburban areas, I say, children they still have. the access to green spaces and open spaces but in calcutta due to these uh, restrictions and the time boundations which we have for accessing the slight amount of greeneries which we have it is a, really a cause of concern and playing on the streets is also not something we, which we get to see in calcutta so much maybe in few neighborhoods which we see or in gated communities where there have amenities such as parks and playgrounds where children can where the children can go and avail but other than that seeing children playing on the streets is slightly not something which we get to see nowadays yeah wow i mean again, it was a theft so, in a way sorry so it is a theft in a way like we are robbing them of their childhood yeah yeah exactly and your remarks about gated communities too once again brings it back to you know it might be useful to think about the kind of theft of childhood in the way that adults and making decisions for and about adults are dominating the entire discussion about how cities are operate and at the same time of course if that's true which as you explained it sounds very compelling to me um but if that's true we also need to to keep in in mind i guess that some children's childhoods are more stolen than others to put it kind of inelegantly because of the way that class obviously matters to this uh, and i'm sure gender as well maybe matters to this uh to this conversation but you also raise another very interesting point around the the video games and this kind of you know um uh sort of activities yeah, just, in yes. front of screens that involve no exercise right I'm sure you've heard a version of this that there's a way in which adults then sort of blame the children themselves. What's wrong with this generation? All they want to do is play video games and it's like, we'll take a look at the world that we've made outside for them when they can't even get safely to to the park. So so even that kind of way in which the organization of cities can make, you know, video games one of the few sort of um options maybe for children who have some free time and whose parents can't just take them to the park. Um then they themselves can become sort of blamed as an age group for in fact doing this do you know what i mean yes yes uh, actually if we see it is a very um, bottom up approach uh, we very rarely we involve the parents or the children in the planning process uh, so whenever as a planner i think participatory planning is very important which is often being neglected so right now what we are doing is um, uh, that the there are several organizations which are actually uh perform uh are not performing i'd say they are organizing more uh events i'll say at a neighborhood level there are several foundations which are coming up and they are encouraging the parents to come on the streets to socialize and to actually experience the place where they are living it is uh, it is very common here i know that in big cities they often say we hardly know our neighbors and this is what is happening here uh, so naturally i see in gated communities people they still have some sort of uh, recreational uh, activities once in a while they where they meet but in few uh, neighborhoods and communities people are completely ignorant i would say that they are not aware who is around them so yes uh, there is, there are initiatives which is being taken to improve more uh, socialize and to improve the current condition by socialization and more interaction So uh, yes, there are changes which is happening right now. Right, right. Wow. Um, okay, so let me ask you one last question. I've taken up quite a bit of your time. So I'm also interested in how people have challenged the dominance of the car. You've talked. We've kind of talked about this a little bit, and it comes up a little bit in your work. But let me just finish with this. What inspires you to study? um and contest car culture in this age of climate crisis on the one hand and widening inequality on the other mm, climate crisis i'll say it's like it, people here in calcutta is still uh, they are not so much into like uh, thinking about uh, maybe a, f- um, a detailed survey would help us in further understanding what people perceive how they actually perceive this climate because here i know the government they have started uh, adding uh, e buses to their fleet which is they are um, which i'll say it is a sort of com- combat uh, for combating the climate crisis we have mass rapid transit we have the railways we have uh, 
the railways within the city we have the metros but still i'll say people here uh, once we start get, since we are getting dependent on our private vehicles and especially during covid the number of vehicles has increased the price of uh, these uh, privately owned vehicles has increased because they did not want to be dependent on the mass transit i'll say because the risks involved during covid so once we and the problem is that once we start getting attached once we start getting dependent on our four wheelers or our motorized two vehicles it will be very difficult for the people to get out of the of that comfort zone i'll say and secondly the age factor i'll say uh, i'll say the younger generation people their aspirations also play a very important role here i mean uh, obviously uh, the when we have less amount of uh, public transit available since here i know the uh, the type of transit we have in kolkata although we, it is higher still i'll say uh, due to this covid and this uh, i'll say the imbalance which has once been created and one uh, as i said that uh, the um, popul if a, a particular age group starts getting dependent it will be very difficult to take them out we have metros which are being where which are in different phases which is being coming which which is coming up but yes age will definitely play a very important role in the long run the consciousness the i'll say the dependency the change in mindset it will take certain bit of time right right and uh and hopefully those younger people will um there'll be some hope in that. i mean it's kind of a mixed message right and that's totally appropriate to the moment um that hopefully there will be you know a uh, greater push from younger people as the as particularly the climate crisis just becomes more and more um sort of obvious uh and impossible to to avoid but also your point is a really sobering and important one around as car culture becomes more entrenched becomes more and more difficult to dislodge right um and i feel like here there there's very little but the very beginnings of sort of the idea of actually what needs to happen is from a planning perspective is that car use itself needs to be restricted rather than than simply encouraging people oh it would be a nice idea for you to leave your car at home if you have one but rather you actually can't drive down this road anymore you know like a kind of a kind of greater measure um and these are very controversial and they're very difficult to to implement because of course people with cars get upset and then those and those people vote and so it often is the case that politicians are very reluctant to do anything to restrict this because they're very worried about the political sort of implications if i'm talking about the uh, this uh, climate crisis part I, i'll say uh, there are other modes of transport which needs to be taken care of and which is being taken care of we have these three wheeler motorized vehicles um, we call them autos uh, mm -hmm. so those two play a very important role there was a time when they used to and they were being run on diesel and uh, the petrol uh which was not the defined form of petrol so naturally even there has been a shift to their lpg modes so that is a part which has been taken up by the government to um, more renewable sources and there are uh, battery operated vehicles also public vehicles these small totos which we call them those are also three wheelers it's like relatively smaller in size even they are being operated with batteries so the government is taking initiative i'll say to move to a better e form of transport more uh, re, uh, eco friendly modes of transportation and in india one interesting thing to note is people here they are also very much dependent on the private two wheelers uh, the car culture is there but at the same time the to, the owning a two wheeler is also very important part of their lives so the so that way people are i'll say the count of have um, Um, the ownership pattern of two wheelers is also at par with car ownership pattern because for two owning a two wheeler is relatively easier for the middle class people and the lower middle class strata of the society than owning a four wheeler so that's way i think the uh, restriction in the use of two wheelers also should also be mandated like there should be some sort of policies coming up so so that the two wheelers can be improvised in a way so that it becomes more environment friendly Yeah, very interesting and and that's it right there's even though it's difficult to get some of the to bring in some of these measures and there's always the issue of budgets as well but it does feel like there is a growing awareness on the part of different sort of local and national authorities that this needs to be addressed and and I see some good examples that you're pointing to here in Birmingham they've recently appointed a cycling and walking commissioner 
Um, Adam Tranter is the person who his name is taking the role. And, uh, and that's a, a great example of a kind of positive step of, of the kind of things you're thinking like, you know, from a government perspective, maybe a planning perspective, this has to be, it's no longer an option. This has to be something that needs to be thought about when, when thinking about how cities um, operate, but, but very, very difficult to bring exactly to your point, very difficult to bring about these changes, especially once it starts to get entrenched and people yes. become used to, I have my car and I drive it where I like and nobody should infringe on yes. that right. So, yeah. Okay, Rituparna, wow, I've taken a, a quite a bit of your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot from it. Um, I'm glad we're recording it because I will be revisiting it and, and thinking about many of the points that you, you've raised here, which have been very useful. Um, for, uh, hopefully, if anyone else watches this, they will, they will immediately see as well uh, the range of insights that you've shared. I really recommend that people um, check out your work, the, the article that I mentioned, which I'll also I'll put a link to below on, uh, when I post this on YouTube. Um, but let me just say thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Thank you, John.